Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Very excited. Hopefully this would be so insightful and will open up your mind for 2019. Oh my goodness. When did it all happen? Like I, I winked and it's already 2000 and I'm getting older. Oh, anyway, I hope it is really insightful. So um, remember you can ask me, there's no stupid question. Everything is useful. Just let me know when you want to know something so that you leave here all psyched up to for your 2019 portfolio. Okay, so just to get into, um, I, you know, certain things, uh, the first one I'm starting with is a common trading mistakes because no one is perfect, neither am I. I do kind of trade and still I have analysis paralysis. Um, and a, a bit of this, I kind of share what I go through as well, being an analyst for so many years. So don't worry. Um, you could be super smart and still make mistakes in trading. It's very tricky. But I've got a few suggestions on how to better your, your analysis. So just to go over the um, common trading mistakes is little preparation or trade training. People feel it's it's quite easy to just get in, and until you lose your money, do you realize you need to put a lot of time in it? And um, there's a lot of training and preparation um, that's needed. So it's pretty much like going to school and learning to do something. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a degree to trade, but you at least need to know how to go about it. The second one would be being too emotional about money, and who wouldn't be? You know, I, I've, I've cried over losing 2,000 rand because money is money, right? And maybe it's because I also just didn't follow my structure. I suppose it was an inward thing. But you, people get too emotional about their money. They lack um, record keeping. I'm also a victim to that. But when you start making a lot of losses, you realize you have to keep record so you can date back and see what it is where you've gone wrong. Next is that they anticipate profits. So what happens is when they get into the trade, and I don't know if you've seen a lot of the recommendations I've made, I'd, I'd probably put that, you know, this is a buying level and this is where I see it going. If it goes there, in their mind, that is where it should be going exactly. So you start fantasizing about the money. And that is the, the worst thing you could do. Start hedging. It, I remember the trading days used to call it hedging, where you haven't even received the money, but you, you've already bought the boat or something in your head, or you've already bought a holiday. Um, so anticipate profits. Um, so blindly following mechanical systems, because of if you're in a chat group and someone says this works for them and you're thinking, oh, they should know better, and you blindly follow it, yet they have a certain way they trade it, which they won't share, but they will say it's giving a signal, but they have a certain technique to it and you don't know and you get in and you lose your money. So very common. My favorite one is not learning how to short. People think getting into the stock market is just about buying. Um, to a point, um, I've had an, uh, an old man one time, um, he was relaying his story, where he bought shares a couple of years ago, and he figured he wanted, you know, in about 15 years, he was like, I should be in the money, you know? And I think it was resource stock or something like that. And he bought and forgot about it. You know, buy and hold is a strategy. And when he wanted to withdraw the money, he had just gone back to break even. So he didn't know how to short. So in his mind, he's going to do this and that. And yes, the like, market turns. And unfortunately, he broke even. And whatever he invested, he got back as it is. Not a nice story, but, you know, just to relay, don't be the old man who did that. Lastly is improper timing. And this is where technical analysis comes in. It at least helps you with timing. People are just blindly getting into the market at whatever price or any price that is suggested um, without any justification as to why they're getting into the market. So my presentation mainly is to make you see the bigger picture and zoom in to, to the share. The common charting mistakes are that you're not, people are not using bigger time frames. So, and they start trading against the trend. And most people could roll their eyes and be like, who could be so stupid to trade against? If it's going up, it's going up. But people tend to just look at the specific time frame they're trading in. So if they're swing traders, they would just look at an intraday chart. Or day traders, they would just look at a day chart and not look at a bigger time frame. And I'll, I'll elaborate what I mean. And maybe that will give you a nice aha moment um, when, I, when I explain it. The second one is they use too many indicators and they misuse them. 
And the common reason for that is because when one indicator is not giving you the desirable results, they then start using a whole lot or trying to find something that resonates with them. Um, and they start using, the, I've seen a chart that's had three indicators at the bottom and this guy's like, I got it under control, don't worry. You're thinking, oh, how do I tell him, you know, it's not the right thing to do. But people use too many indicators. Also, which I forgot to put there, is using no indicator. And I'll tell you why as we get into um, the presentation even deeper. Last is they follow emotions rather than signals. Um, I've done that before where I could see the thing is extremely overboard, but it's making money. And I become emotional about it, excited. And when it drops, I then lose the money. But when I had followed the signal that was giving it a, a very obvious get out, I still stayed in. It was my emotional part of it. So the emotions are so critical in training. Um, we're gonna have to, it, it's, it's imperative to master them, but I'll get into that even further. Let's start with um, using a bigger time frame. When I, when I talk about using a bigger time frame, it's pretty much how it is when you, if you identify a country or, or let's say you wanted to stay specific in a specific country or something, you would look at a globe, zoom into whatever continent and go to the country so you could get to know where you're going to be living. For instance, you'd be looking for South Africa, you know, okay, it's in the southern um, equator, southeast hemisphere, the neighbors. You need to know what you are trading, not just the share itself. It's entire, it's almost like forming a relationship with what you are trading to know every tick of it. And people make the mistake of trying to get into too many things and not understanding what this particular, make it your baby, what this particular share or commodity or currency, where in its life it is at. When you do that, you then will then realize that the stock market has five stages to it. Okay, it's literally in that type of formation where you have the accumulation stage. You'd have your markup stage, your greedy stage, distribution stage, and your markdown stage. And then it then it then resumes back into ooh, what am I doing? Here's a red. Then it goes back to accumulation, markup, greedy stage. That's how the market trades, and that's how it flows. When you look at a bigger time frame, you're able to discover which part the market's at. It may not be as clean slate as that, but it gives you an idea how you're trading. And most people don't have that. They'll just follow whatever particular trend they are trading in at that, partic at, at that particular point in time. But in that, when you have that, when you, ha when you have that idea of um, what stage your share is trading in, you then know there is then three phases to a trend, okay? The first, in a bull trend, you would then have your accumulation stage, your participa participation stage, and your exit stage. Um, I used to, I call it the one, two, three phase. So what happens is, as it develops, your trend becomes steeper upwards. And if you look at it on, um, in a bear market, the opposite would work it becomes steeper downwards. So how you then determine what stage it's now entering in is you need to be able to draw your trend lines quite meticulously to understand this. And each time, the, um, for instance, okay, let me just go back to the bull market um, part of it. Okay. So with the bull market, this would be the channel it, it trades in. And once it breaches the upper slope of the channel, there's a tendency of a trend to become slightly steeper. And in that case, you would then draw, you could try it at home. I've, I've done it with Sai a couple of times, even in, uh, some people probably know my seminars I used to do at Santa Bank. And you, if you, sometimes when you just open up the share and you look at it, it's so obvious on which stage, I mean, which phase in this part of the trend it's in, whatever share you're looking at, because the trend just becomes steeper. And once the, upper slope or the resistance trend line of, this, of the participation phase starts, then comes the 
access phase. And that is usually so steep that in most cases you can't, you can't get no support or resistance level from it. Um, at the time where you cannot get any support and resistance level, you must know it's in the access stage. And in most cases, most when I used to go to my roadshows, asset managers would ask me what stage is it in. And if it is the access stage, that's where they start selling. So they would sell on all your buys. And what the access stage is, it's so tricky and so um, so delicious because it moves quite fast and you want to be in it. So you buy on someone else's sell. And in most cases, I always say to people, those are the two, at least those two things you need to get in is what stage your share is in and then what phase. So I'll go into it as we go along, but remember those stage and phase, because many people have, because of whatever, you know, stellar results that have come out, um, they do, the company's doing pretty well. And then you feel, oh, but this is a nice long-term investment. And when it is, you probably getting it at its access phase, because inevitably after it's reached an access phase, when asset managers are now selling on your buys, the more, skillful money starts catching wind of that and what happens after the access phase you have a huge correction and the correction could last about 40 to 50 percent now imagine if you get into a share in its access phase um and you should always know that when anything reports or if buddies of yours say listen we need to get into the share try and find out which phase it's in first because you could be right at the tail end of something that's going to pull back there are many examples I could tell you of. Um, NASPERS was on the access phase. There are so many examples where it looks, and access phase is the most attractive phase. It's moving fast, you're looking at huge gains, but it's the, also the most dangerous phase. So unless you're in already, if you're in the share and it's in the access phase, you just wait for your monthly RSI to pull back to get out. But if you're in the inception and you want to get into the share and it's on the excess phase, really, there are other shares you can get into or other currencies or other commodities. Don't be stuck on that. Now, this is looking at it on a monthly chart, and I'll explain it. But this one, two, three phase works on intraday. If you are looking to get into any share and you can see candles that are almost looking that way, that steep, do yourself a favor and just hold on. Don't, don't get in because that pullback is usually quite steep and you don't want to be part of that pullback. It is the most painful experience and it gets associated like, you know, you get associated with pain when you trade and that's not the point. Okay. So remember the five stages and then the phases within the trend. Okay. Oh, so oh, so same happens with um, the same happens in a bear trend. Same policy. I'll give you a typical example, and I remember having to talk about this. It was actually on CNBC, and it was way then, and it was called something technically fundamental. So it was fundamental analysis with technical, and we would kind of argue or we would agree on the share. And one of them was um, telecom, and telecom was at its access bear trend. And at that time, it's usually the best time to get in because once it breaches, oh, oh, I'm not getting used to this. So once it gets out of its access phase, it then starts going up. And needless to say, you, I mean, telecom is doing pretty well. I'm still liking it. But that's how you then know when something has reached the end of its an uh, access and is on markdown in a bear trend and in a bull trend it would be on access stage and on a greedy phase stage doesn't make sense so make sure you get that covered first before you start getting into what level should i get in what level should i get out th that part of the scenario the useful tip with that how you are able to then determine this is by dating back your chart so you, everyone whether you're a swing trader where whether you're a day trader or weekly date back your chart and the best way to do that oh let, let me first give you the reasons why it's best to date um, to date it back because history repeats itself um dating back the trend lines give you an idea on how 
far momentum of the trend can still go. I'll give you a few examples. Okay. Two is that key, there are key historical levels. And those key historical levels you can only get when you date back your chart to inception, right back. So if, it, if your charting system can go back to 2007 or whatever, 2000 from the inception, date it right back and see where it is, what that particular index share is in its lifespan. And by doing that, you'll be able to then discover whether it's in the third phase, second phase, whether you can get in, get out, whether it's safe to be buying or not. Because there are a lot of shares that are, just do not get in because they're overextended and you just be doing yourself a great ingest if you get into them. The second reason is you need to know by dating it back, it will you will then be able to determine whether that particular trend is in a correction, if there is a pullback, or is it a complete change in trend. And that you will only know when you date back your charts. Okay. So it's because history repeats itself. There are always key historical levels that get tested and they become psychological levels. And you need to understand in the tra in whatever you're trading, what if it's if, if it's moving against the trend, is it a mere correction, or is it a complete reversal in trend? Okay, that's what they say that people trade against um, against the trend. It's because they will probably be buying, and this is it's you know it's just a little bit of upside only for it to continue with the bear trend, and you're thinking it's entered a bull trend. You'll see in the examples I'm going to give you now. So my suggestion is, if you, I've, I've used a um, Sivanya Gold chart here, and my suggestion is, when you ever, if someone, if you are looking to get into a share or a buddy of yours or your little, or your crew says, let's get into this particular share, first thing you do is go back to your monthly chart. Don't look at the default, I think, in most charts will either be a minute chart or a day chart. Go back to your monthly chart and date it back to inception. And with Sabanya Gold, the inception is around, um, I think that was this way, 2014. Now, this is what Sibanya is. So I'm looking at the monthly chart. So I'm trying to get, I'm trying to understand Sibanya before I trade it. Okay. And the first thing I see, oh, okay. First thing you obviously can see there, remember the whole stages, distribution, where it is, greedy stage. Where's the little greedy stage, distribution mark, markdown. So in your, in your mind now, you know, okay, it's in the markdown stage and most probably the cumulative stage, which means people are now going to come in and buy. But firstly, draw your trend lines. It's obviously still in a bear trend. It hasn't broken out of its bear trend, so you trade carefully. You then draw what your support and resistance levels are, and in this case, you can see where I've drawn my, it's where their key, key levels being drawn. It's still in a bear trend. And the potentiality here is it's bottoming up because that's what would happen if it's in, in, a cumul in the markdown phase. The next type of pattern that forms is something that will get it out of whatever trend it is to start a new trend. To me, once it gets out of the, that bear trend, it's a, it's a hot donut. Okay, so I'm preparing my money. Fine. So it's tested. It's in the bear trend, but um, it just needs to at least trade. Uh, let me just see. At that point... Oh, it's above um, 12 something. It's just 1250. Then above that level, because it's also key, it was a support that's now becoming resistance. Above that level, the monthly the monthly chart says above 1250. It's now out of a bear trend and in a new bull trend. So you would not, if you are, you know, if you would not be shorting this at this point in time. You'd be looking to actually do a buy and hold, right? So now I've got that picture in my head. It's in the markdown phase, access first part, which is the, I'm not access, rather the accumulative stage, there's going to be some buying momentum. That I've got clear in my head. Now when you look at it, oh, and then obviously when it breaks up there, when it breaks above that, that's the next resistance will go. And usually it does a 100% retracement because remember the whole structure of it is to do this, right? It may not be as clean as this all the time, but I'll show you tricks on how, what would help you determine the whole wavy thing um, that you would get. So 
Now it will start that part before it does that. But this is a monthly chart. It could take years to form that. Okay. Now look at it on the weekly chart. The weekly chart is, I mean, it's similar, but it's not giving you the same detail as what your monthly chart is giving you. On your weekly chart, it says, obviously, it agrees with the monthly chart that it's in a bear trend. And you draw your support and resistance. You get, um, with this, you would probably then you would see what key support is at that point, which would be just below 8. It's also kind of hitting towards a 12, um, that 12.50 or that, that resistance trend line. So you would know that if it does bridge there, that is supported by the monthly chart. So that level, which is dated back from inception on the monthly chart, is tied in with what you should do on the weekly chart. Now, if you, for instance... Sorry, if you were looking at it on a daily chart, obviously it would be less, it would be more busy and not as condensed as the other one is. This to me, this would be telling you, if you didn't look at the monthly chart at all and you went straight to a daily chart, this would have said, this is a breakout. It's in a bear trend. I mean, it's broken out of a bear trend and is in a bull trend. Now you are static. You're selling your house, your kids, you want to buy Sivanya Gold, right? But in this my in my mind, I'd say, okay, that little peak that's gone up is a recovery within the entire bear trend. So I wouldn't be going long aggressively because this could just continue with the bear trend. But if you just opened up your daily chart, you would you would automatically think, oh my goodness, um, it's in a bull trend. This with I mean, this is this is this is when you start hedging. This is when you start seeing profits. Thinking of buying a bigger house, you know, it's broken out of a bear trend. I'm going to be making money, but then it then you start realizing, but why did it turn back at that point in time, right? If you look, go back to your charts, why did it reverse? Because it has a tendency of reversing every time it hits, and that trend line is now taken back from your monthly chart. So if you had gone long, if you had gone long, let's say you went long earlier, let's say you went long around here, you would then know that the limitations of this upside would be this would would this would, this trend line which is dated back on your monthly chart would limit further upside. So when it hits that part, I should start reconsidering my position. Either I should sell or stay in. So if this, if this is what you were trading based on, you would be surprised why there is this pullback because this is supposed to be in a, it's, it's a bear trend breakout. And the pullback would have made sense because it's tested a trend line that it's been struggling to break since, um, I didn't really see, it was since 2000. And so this is since 2017. So if you if the daily chart will give you early entry, but it will then the monthly chart will tell you how far it could possibly go and where you should then consider getting out. Obviously, if it then goes totally in your position, because the, the reason why I say that, because it's very easy for this at this point for it to test, fall back, breach that and just extend this bear trend. And you've gone and you've sold your kids. Now you're living under a bridge because you made bad judgment, bad decisions. If you just looked at the monthly chart and you dated back your trend line, you would have known. This is not a breakout. It's a mere correction or recovery within a bear trend. But obviously, if it starts going above whatever level, which was 1250, then you can go long and strong, increase your position. That's how people clever money trades. They look at what the monthly chart is doing and any intermediary ch um, trades that are offered or early, and early entries or exits are done from the daily and the intraday. But they will know the limitations of where it will go based on what the monthly is saying because history repeats itself. If it's failed a number of times, the possibilities will fail again. But if it breaks through it, then you're in the money. But you know exactly where to start taking profits. And that is the part of learning how to sell. Okay. Does it please stop me if I'm not making sense?
Jeez, am I that good? Obviously. No, I'm kidding. Look, you can ask me any time. Just if I'm not making sense, and if you just practice this, you'll, you'll. It, I call it getting to know. It's like dating anyone. You, you get to know them, what their tendencies are. Don't just buy a share for the sake of it being newsworthy or get to know it, trade it. I probably, I'm, I'm told I do pretty well with the rand, um, you know, where it's going to go, because I made an effort to, that's one currency I know, I know. And I speak to it, I'm like, where are you going? Because I know if you go there, you've got a tendency to do this. You know, get to know, familiarize, familiarize yourself with that share. You'll get to know its tendencies and what happens. And especially when you have your resistance and your support levels, you already know what is going to come. So that's where people go wrong with investing. It's just no timing and blindly getting into the share. Date back your share. Whether you're an intraday or even a minute trader, date back so you know, okay, I am getting in, I'm buying a share in a bear market. That means I do not put all my money in it. My stop losses need to be tight, but I could see this upside going there. That type of mentality. Okay, so let's go back to, okay, so that was just a typical example. So this is how I would read this. Um, so on the daily chart, it obviously showed that this there was going to be upside towards there, and when it gets there, it will halt and pull back like it is done now. But now there are two parts to this. So if it continues, this is how I'm reading this share now. It's forming rising bottoms. Now if it continues, it increases the likelihood of it breaching that resistance trend line that's dated back so far. And once it, that this trend line is breached, that's a big deal. Now you, you can sell your, your mom as well. You know, and buy. But this is what's happened. It's gonna so it's kind of teetering there. It's tested one, two, three. It's testing there. If it obviously then bounces there, another intermediate level to get in is ten rand. With potential upside to about thirteen. So what was the buy it was forty fourteen something. That was the buying. So it's with potential ten rand to about thirteen. So that is your near-term goal or whatever, a month or whatever, whatever it takes. But 10 Rand because it's support that's become resistance and now it's an important level. So above that, upside towards there. Then I might have to readjust or close my trade if it fails again. But if it doesn't, you would increase at that next resistance level. But you know that if it breaches that trend line, which is dated back far, you're on safe territory. Does it make sense? Okay. Otherwise, if it doesn't um, and it trades through that, it would have also breached an important support level, uh, support trend line, which is tested, as you see, that many times. Therefore, it has a likelihood to fall back all the way to 7 Rand. You wouldn't be buying it. Instead, you could short it, you know, CFD. So, um, and that would be the limitations of how far it will fall because it is tested there and held a few times before. And obviously, if it breaches it, there'll be a steeper trend as it goes on. But every level given gives you an understanding of where it will go to next. Okay. So I call it a top-down approach. First thing you need to do is what the monthly chart does is give you – it gives you – uh, the amount of information a monthly chart, and people take monthly charts so for granted, it gives you invaluable information about how the markets are trading. You need to know what you're trading. It stipulates at what stage the trend is at, like I've mentioned, and it also gives you an indication or if or how people are, are participating in the market. If you just go back to the whole five stages of distribution, Greedy. So you would know once you date it back at what stage is this share. Oh, it looks like it's in a greedy stage, so I mustn't be buying it. Because because you don't want to buy anything that's in a greedy stage. Because yeah, it will bite you. Then you go your week. What your weekly chart does is, it's it's mostly used by traders. So a lot of intraday traders would stop at the weekly chart. But dating back your chart is the most important thing to do. So it is used widely by traders and in most cases they would use it 
um, to see what the indicators are doing. If they have any, you know, leverage to get into and for how long they can be in a trade. Um, your daily chart obviously would then reveal any daily fluctuations um, within the overall picture. And then your intraday chart will give you earlier entry and exit points. Actually, both your daily and your intraday chart will give you early entry or exit points. So once you know what the entire structure is of the share, you can then trade in between and know whether you should be shorting or longing within whatever trend it's trading at. Okay. Yeah. Using few indicators. I've seen, like I said, I've seen someone with three indicators and he's thinking he's got it all under control. And it's not usually the case. First thing you need to remember is you have to do the chart first. You look at the chart first and then your trading indicators will come second. Don't look at your, your indicator first, then look at your chart. Then you're doing something horribly wrong. Um, so it's your chart first and then your, 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 your indicator. This is because using too many will literally get you broke. Um, and that's because it could, they, they tend to contradict themselves. And the reason why they do that is because some people do not differentiate between their lagging and leading indicators. And you need to know which ones are lagging and which ones are leading. And if you put them both in, all of them in the chart, then you'll, you'll make the mistake. There'll be, there'll be such contradiction that it's confusing and it takes the joy out of trading. Okay. <laughs> The common indicators we know of would be your relative strength, rate of change, stochastics, uh, moving average, Bollinger Bands. I, I have friends who try and discover the less known and to, uh, they are all there. There is a multitude of indicators. I don't know if you've heard of the per um, percentage price oscillator. No? Popcorn curve, maybe? Anyone use that? No. Um, super trend? People get into this to try, everyone's trying to make money. My favorite, and I, you can go and look it up. There is, a, uh, there is an indicator called no sure thing. Apparently it's profit making, just, you know. But people will try it to try and, you know, they're trying to find because they're either not getting satisfaction with this indicator, and they will go. But mine is stick to two indicators. Choose, find one that resonates with you, that you seem to master one or two and stick to them. Don't try and find new ones to get another cent into your profits or, or anything like that. Why are oscillators necessary? Because they often confirm the direction of the trend. Because most people say you should just use a naked chart. I, I, I don't agree with that because I feel oscillators really do give you, is it, good, is it a good time to go in now or not? Um, and they confirm patterns. So if they, the oscillators do a lot of, they, I call it the second opinion when you go to a doctor. They, that's what it is. They then determine when the trend is running out of steam. Your oscillators will definitely tell you when that is happening. Um, you are able to identify overbought and oversold positions, crossovers, which if you're not really looking at patterns, you can always trade using crossovers. And my favorite is divergence. If there's divergence in the oscillator, you simply do not get into the trade particularly if there's divergence in a daily chart. Okay. My favorite ones, uh, my personal favorite one is the moving average, and that's to determine a trend, the simple moving average. Then the relative strength. Uh, the relative strength would be, oh, this is coming off a bit funny. It, it wasn't like this. I suppose it's not picking up those fonts. But that's, I love, everyone who knows how I analyze the relative strength is my favorite for overbought and over soul extremes. And MACD, I personally love for any crossover, I mean, crossover trading. Okay. Let's start with the moving average. I'm just going to really wrap, go through this quite quickly because I'm sure everyone knows what a moving average does. But for those who don't, it really smooths out action over time. So it removes any noise in between and shows you what the trend is um, at that point. So... Um, by looking at the slope of the moving average, you can then see if they, what the potential direction of market prices is. The two popular ones would be your simple and exponential moving average, but I'm just going to stick to the simple moving average. So just for the, you know, I'm, I'm just going to put how it works for people who don't know. This purple is a moving average, and I personally like the 20-day moving average because it, the 10-day tends to be, it fluctuates with the price 
So you, it's too, it's, unless you, you're into this whole getting in and out of the trade. But I feel like the 20-day does a better smooth, move, a smooth moving average. Um, and don't choose a five-day then because it's a bit pointless. You might as well just go up, trade up and down. 20 is usually the best to use. And obviously what would happen is that if your, if your price chart, so this would be your price chart, and I'm using candles here, crosses over your moving average, it would give you a sell. And, you know, it really does work because you would then stay, you'd be short, short, short. I mean, you'd start panicking there a little, but then you'd be like, okay, not really, panic, panic, but you'd be on the downside. And when it crosses over, price chart crosses over, that would be a buy signal and there's upside. You would sell there, a bit of support met, and then you would buy and that's the upside. So it really does work. Just the crossover part. That's if you're not interested in patterns or anything like that. You just want to be in the share when it crosses over. Very simple to use, effective, but also very nice if you use the 20-day. The rest could be a bit un too 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 um, too cryptic. Um, this is an Aspers moving average. Uh, so, oh, the point about this was moving averages work quite a lot when the market is trending. So they work really good when the market's trending but when there's a bit of choppiness like i said you see you've got your sell and, and then all of a sudden it's a buy and then you get whipsaws this is what's called whipsaws when it's trading between so in most cases you would just hold until there is a proper signal that's given to go long um you'd buy sell so then at that point you'd get a buy signal that would starts trending and then there's a sell there so in non-trending markets a moving simple moving average could be a bit frustrating and when if it does, if it is oscillating within that moving average, you would rather just stay out of the market or use some other indicator that will um, assist with that. My, okay, my suggestion, a tip is, if you want to, okay, that little thing was supposed to show there. Anyway, it was supposed to highlight that if you want to, if you want to get to know. Um, at what phase or stage the market is, your 50 day, 50, 50 period. So if you put it on a 50, I would say the 50 week moving average, you remember the whole distribution that, that, that you shaped. So your 50 week would give you a better. So without you having to determine, oh my goodness, how am I, where should I place this little, um, where should I draw this uh, thing to know, this little U-shape to know which part of the market is it? Your 50-day usually would give you your an indication. So you would know that's accumulation stage. Um, it's, it's past its markup stage. That was potentially the greedy stage. And this is actually NASPERS, and this was done recently. So NASPERS is five to possibly reaching the distribution stage, which means it will then pull back before it gets to the markup stage, which then makes... You know, I mean, NASPERS accounts a lot for the top 40. So it gets you thinking about where the top 40 will be going. If NASPERS reaches the distribution stage, it means anticipate downside. It's currently holding there because of its, of its trend line. But if it breaches, and, you know, just that little breach means it's disrespecting the trend line already. So it has potential. It could just pull back and start the distribution stage, which means anticipate downside. So... You see, knowing that from that U-shaped, you are thinking, okay, maybe it's not the time to be buying NASPERS at this point. Because you know you have that analogy, it's fallen so much. I mean, let's buy. But then now, because you know that U-shaped figure, you're thinking, oh, freak. If this thing goes down, distribution stage, markdown. And distribution stage could be a whole 100% down to about there because that's how, before it starts accumulation. So remember that type of U-shaped wave. Oh, little line. This is Discovery Holdings, okay? Most recent chart, accumulation stage, markup stage. It could be on greedy stage, okay? So it means you can still stay in because it's in a bull trend, but you need to be cautious because if this then breaches its long-term trend line, it will reach distribution stage, which means downside, which a change in trend completely. Okay. And what else did I look at here? 
okay, so this is Kumba Iron Ore. Now, this is just, dist- this, um, in this chart, I'm merely showing you um, how this whole knowing what stage the market is in. So this is Kumba Iron Ore. That was the accumulation stage. That was the markup stage. That was the greedy stage. When the greedy stage ended, when I say distribution stage, the distribution stage, oh, okay, there's a bit of a delay with my, this is the distribution stage. And it reached the markdown stage. Now it's on accumulation stage, which means, oh, now I can buy Kumba. Can you see? And this is using the 50-week moving average. So it gives you an indication instead of having to understand, where do I draw this U? Your 50-week average will give you a sense of where it is. Okay. Um, Accumulation stage. Remember, accumulation stage accumulation stage, then it's the markup, which means it could then go up before it reaches a greedy stage. By that time, you're long and you're strong. Okay. Moving average divergence and convergence. Okay. So that's the MACD. Um, little, uh, I know you probably know what it is, but just to, for the ones who don't know, um, the important part of MACD would be the bottom chart. Um, where you'll have your MACD line and your signal line. And the MACD line would be the one with a shorter period, um, which is the 12. And your your signal line would be the 26 period. These are all defaults. This is what you get. So it's a crossover. The buy and sell signals will be given from the crossover of these, um, of the shorter period and the longer period. Okay. So when the shorter crosses the longer, it will give you a buy, and it and truly there is upside. Um, so if it crosses downward, the shorter period crosses the longer, it would give you a sell, um, as you can see there, and then a buy signal. So it's a crossover effect. So if it's if it's muttering, if they just there's too much crossovers, you would rather hold, or else I mean if you have the time to get in and out, you know. But this is what MACD is usually good for the crossover of, and it, it works pretty well, and give you a sell signal. Where the shorter period crosses, then that will give a sell signal, and indeed the share does fall. Okay. Um, what I like about MACD, besides the moving average crossovers, is the histogram. People take the histogram for granted. The histogram, oh man. I mean, people look at the crossover, try the histogram. And I'll give you examples for that. MACD histogram, the reason why it's important, it measures the distance between the MACD line and signal line, so it's the shorter period, the, the periods. It's that distance between the periods, so it measures that, and then it, it does a little charting effect at the bottom. Um, so it oscillates between zero, so it's above zero and below zero. Uh, oh, okay, it's designed to identify divergence and convergence of the crossover. Okay, so as I said, if it's along the zero line, so above zero, it means there's upside, there's bullish momentum. People are buying below, downside, bearish momentum, they're selling. The importance of a histogram is that it breaches the gap between the price movement, price, 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 and the MACD chart. Um, The values, so as the histogram increases, so I'll show you now, as it increases, it it then tells you, that you should be in the share, whether you're long or short. As it decreases, which gives you a negative value, it will then tell you to start getting out. So an indication that there's um, a ripe crossover that's happening is when your histogram starts forming a lower, let's say on the upside, it starts forming a lower bar than the previous one. So most people would say to you, um, you only start getting out of the position or buying the position when there is a crossover. I say follow your histogram for that because I'll show you an example that by the time it crosses, it's when your histogram hits the zero line, but it would have already told you when you should be preparing to get out, not on the crossover itself. Okay. Um, In other words, it would decrease in height. So what it happens is it grows and then it decreases. It grows and decreases. And each time it decreases, it's telling you to start acting in the opposite position. 
So don't look at the crossover itself. Look at what your histogram is doing because it will give you divergence. And in, the nice thing about divergence, it's, tell you, it's telling you when, the, um, when that trend is starting to weaken, momentum of that trend. It means buyers are lessening in a bull trend or sellers are, are lessening in a downtrend. As in the, the less sellers in the downtrend. So what I love about histogram is that it indicates extremes, overbought and oversold. My trick with a histogram is always to put, to put these, um, so this is a, a line I put myself. So it's put it on the extreme. So any time that it goes above that line, I would know it's reached an overbought stage and I should start looking for a curve in the, in, with the histogram. So this is clicks, recent chart. So if you were long and you know the crossover here, so what would happen is if you're looking at this point here, your histogram started to turn as in the bars became less as this was still hitting its lows. It held there, but if you started to go long at this point in time, when the crossover happens, this is just confirming that you should be long, and this is where, so around here, you would have been getting into the share. And when the crossover that says buy, you would already be in it. I'll show you a proper example because I've made it, you know, I've zoomed in a little. And so you are trading the histogram and not the, the crossover because it tells you extremes of now at this point you'd be looking to, you can see it's in an extreme. So you should be looking to close your position because your histogram is starting to, to drop. Evidently so. I mean, this is quite high. And you know when I mentioned the third phase of the of the trend, usually this is how the candles are on the third phase. You can't find any support or resistance at that point, and it's that's the dangerous point um, stage. That's another example. So every time you you create a mean of where it tends to stop, the reason why I drew those is that I will then have an indication that oh okay, because of the previous, it has a tendency to only start turning there. In this case. It is an exception. It's breached, which means, okay, now it's overdone. I need to really get out. If you were wondering when to get out, if this upside was going to continue, your histogram would be telling you when, it would, when momentum is starting to slow down. Okay. Another reason why I like it is obviously that divergence. Now, this is MTN. Many people have been asking me what my view on MTN is. I know, sir. I must admit, I was I was really bullish on MTN until um, I even had it on Twitter until the happenings. The happenings just don't seem, you know, Nigeria is quite adamant. But then it pulled back. So this was a typical gap. This is news-related information that caused that pullback. So now everyone, one thing you must know about gaps: gaps are always closed. It might not happen today, but it will eventually be closed. And most traders always look at where the gap is and get in and get out when the gap is closed. Okay, so the divergence in this that I'm pointing out is I also always draw the lines on where it's starting to fall because at this point, um, there are two things. If you had to remove this part of the, the chart and you were looking at that, as a trader, you would know, okay, it's hitting support. But there are two things about something that hits support. It's either hitting support to bounce back up or it's just the rest for it to go down. So it's just taking a breather to continue to resume the bear trend. What the histogram would do is actually give an indication that, no, it's not a breather. Um, it's it's going to start turning. So when you draw this line and it keeps going up, and whilst this is moving sideways and hitting that support, what this histogram is saying is that buying momentum is coming in. It's not just a breather. There are people actually buying at that support level. So you would then feel comfortable to get in. I mean, not completely in, but start nibbling into getting um, into uh, your, your, your uh, what you call, MTNs. And at this point, as you can see, um, it's now reached, it's gone up, but now it's reached a key, it's, it, you know, it formed, it, it formed a high. It's been kind of teetering on that high. So in your mind, you're thinking, okay, is this the end of this trend? Will they be downside or will it breach this and go up and potentially close that gap? This 
started to diverge. So this, it's, it's diverging, but now it's muttering on the zero. Like it's not doing much movement. But the anticipation at this point is that if it does go above and that level is 92, already if you look carefully, your histogram is starting to tick up a little. So that is giving an idea that there's a potentiality that this would breach resistance and close the gap. So what you're doing is more, you're not entering the position, you obviously enter it when that level is breached, but you're already anticipating, so you're gathering up your sense to go long. But your histogram daily will tell you, is it, if it's growing and if the bars are growing, then you know there's a higher, you know, the potential of it breaching it is quite higher than it pulling back. Okay. Histogram is key. Yeah. So this is just a pattern. Like this is a, this is an ascending triangle. If it breaks up, um, upwards. So yeah, that's, that's, the histogram is preparing you to go to buy with potential upside. Um, and closing that gap. So as I said, my suggestion is trade the histogram to let the cross overdo a confirmation. Let, let it confirm that. Okay. That's the best way to trade. Like if you want to catch it earlier then, because if you look, if you look at the histogram, if you just go home and experiment with it and you start looking where your histogram is decreasing in size and where your, your crossover is, you will see that you could have made you know, there is some money that could have been made in between before the crossover was made, you know, before the crossover occurred. Okay. Trading rules um, with, the, with, the, um, with the histogram is that if the current bar is higher or is higher than the preceding bar, bulls are, control, bulls are in control and you must prepare to go long. So if... If it's forming a bar and then the next bar, okay, that's what's the downside. So if the next bar is higher, then it's saying to you prepare to go long. And the opposite will apply in a bear trend. If it's going lower, then it will tell you that it's time to sell. Okay, if you were long and your bars are now getting shorter or they're starting to, you must know, time to get out. You now reach the top with the share. So if your next bar is lower, then do yourself a favor. You know, maximize your profits and, and get out. Okay, so the trading rules with that is that you would then buy when the MACD histogram stops falling and it ticks up, so it's falling and then it starts ticking up, you would then buy and pre pre place your protective stop just below the low of, your, of that candle, of that previous candle. Am I making sense? So it's a candle that has dropped and your histogram starts rising on the next candle, you would then or the following candle, let's say if you want to wait for another candle to confirm and your histogram is start rising, you would buy there and the, the low of the previous candle would be your protective stop. Does it make sense? So if you want to trade it that way and the opposite would apply if it's selling. So if it stops rising and starts ticking down, you would place, you would short and place your protective stop on the high of yesterday's candle. Okay, to get into the the, 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 the share on time. Okay, so this was just an example of if you look at the histogram there when it's at zero, that's the only time it crosses over, but at this point it was telling you to sell. Can you see what I'm saying? So don't ignore as little as it is on the chart, it has the most valuable information ever. Okay, that's another part um, right there. That was telling you to buy. Look where the crossover happens. Look, you, you can wait for the crossover. It's, it's entirely up to you. But if you really want to master your trade, you look at the histogram. And that's another example. I just added a few examples there. Right. Useful tip is that, oh, still, again, with the, with the MACD, maintain different time frames. Look at a greater time frame to execute your smaller trades. So if you... It's a similar to what I said. If you're looking at knowing what your monthly chart is doing, you would then know how to execute on the daily chart and intraday and everything. Why? Because the weekly signals are more important than then posted on the charts because what is happening on the weekly chart is more important than what's happening on the daily chart. Your daily chart is just giving you early entry and exits. Your weekly is telling you the direction and so is your monthly. 
Um, so use your weekly to determine your weekly signals to determine market direction and the daily signals to fine tune your entry and exits. Okay. So how to cherry pick your stocks? So if you're looking at an index, and in this particular one, I looked at the um, t um, well, t tele is it telecoms index, telecoms index. So we're looking at Vodacom. Now, just looking at the MACD, um, this is obviously you see that your your this is the monthly chart monthly and um, you could see obviously Vodacom is in a bear trend reached there your MACD has fallen below your histogram is below the zero line okay so at this point you think okay let me look at the MACD let's see MTN psh, definitely below zero line um, crossover here even says you must stay short um, in the long term you know, and you look at your telecoms, your telecom is in a bear trend, but there's that. Now, remember when a monthly crossover happens, that's a different story than what your daily and your weekly crossover. That is giving you a long term signal. So, if that is crossing over to say a buy, then what you should be doing on your daily and weekly chart is buying. Do you, do you, you see what I'm saying? So how would I cherry pick if I had to choose that? I'd be like, okay, it looks like out of that index, Telcom would be giving me a buy, so I should be in Telcom and not MTN at this point. The MTN was just giving you, remember, I was using a daily chart. That was just giving you daily entry. That's if you're in and out. But if you're trying to build a portfolio, at this point it says, wait, don't get in. Also, the Vodacom. And that gap looks, but the minute this starts ticking up, like it's doing now, it's saying there seems to be some buying momentum coming in. But rather, just if you want to, you know, it's it's obviously saying this is probably the end of that downside, which means it's a mere correction within the bigger picture. But you'd want a bit more confirmation, especially if it's a monthly chart. If it's a daily, weekly, you can just bang it out and get into your positions. Okay. My last one is relative strength index, and this is going to go by very quickly because my, really my tricks about relative strength are just, there's so many, um, and I usually do them in my seminars. Um, I'm just mentioning vague ones at this point because I could go on about relative strength. That's how much I love it. But um, we'll stick to it. As you know, it oscillates between 0 and 100 in that band. Um, above 50, people consider it, or traders would consider it market bullish. Below 50, um, it indicates that there's bearish uh, momentum that's coming in. I usually like the 80 mark. Some people keep it at 70, 30. I keep it at 80, 20. So if it's above 80 or 70, it's considered overbought, meaning do not get in. Wait for it to pull back first, and then you get in. 30, below 30 or 20 is considered oversold. It means um, you can get in or don't sell if you're looking at selling and it's oversold because it's telling you it's – cheap therefore it could go up and if it's overbought it's expensive and therefore it could pull back depending on which chart you're looking at if it's a daily chart it will pull back for a few days if it's a weekly chart it will pull back for a few weeks monthly chart it's a change in trend okay um overbought price is expensive a pullback expected prepared to sell if it's overbought if it's oversold price is cheap recovery is anticipated prepare to buy that's the whole concept of how to do um how to use um, rate of strength. It does work, as you can see. That is overbought. It says you should sell, and indeed it does fall. That is oversold. It says you should buy, and it does go up. Um, and that is it. The periods, there's no wrong or right period. People always ask, where would you keep your RSI period? Um, it, it depends on your trading strategy, your style. The longer it is, the longer the period, it obviously smooths out your RSI. And the shorter period will it'll be more volatile, will give you more entry and exit points. The longer period won't. I just gave a bit of an example there. Um, people's, you'll, some people would use 21 day. To me, it really doesn't say much. There's no point in using it. The default is 14 day. If you go to a charting system, it will always default to 14. Um, still too smooth for me. It, but, you know, when your 14 day RSI is overbought or oversold, that's a very big deal. Right, but in most cases it would just stay within that 80-20 band. That's a seven day. I haven't really they have I've heard of people use seven day. Um it becomes a bit more volatile, but my favorite favorite is a three. So it's not three day, it's a three period. 
So if you place on your chart three, it will move to a three-month um, RSI, three-week RSI, three-day RSI, three, you know, whatever period you're using, just use a three. And as you can see, the shorter the period is, the more it will give you the overbought or oversold extremes, um, as you can see there. My suggestion with your RSI is if you're trading, do not buy when the weekly chart is overbought. So if you're thinking of ever trading, look at what your weekly chart is doing. If your weekly chart is in between 80, 20, and your daily chart, let's say, is overbought, just wait for your daily to pull back. But never, never enter a position when your weekly chart is overbought. Never buy. And never sell when your weekly chart is oversold. Because as I said, a turn in that overbought or oversold um, condition on the weekly chart is not a pullback for a few days. The pullback could last about three to four weeks. So even if your daily chart is even if your daily chart is not in overboard territory and you're thinking of going long, just touch back to your weekly to see if it's if it's not overboard. Because if you go long there and the weekly starts pulling back, you'll be you'll be surprised as to but this I mean it wasn't overboard. What's happening? Because your weekly will tell you I'm temporarily going to pull back if it's overboard. And s oversold, I'm temporarily going to go up. So your, not Bible, um, but more your little indicator before you ever get into any position is look at your weekly RSI and where. If it's in between 80, 20, do whatever you want. And also another point I want to put is that if it's just entered overboard territory, remember weekly chart could remain in overboard territory for an extended period than a daily. So if it's just entering it, you can go long. Just don't go long when it's, ripe in overboard territory and ripe in oversold territory. I mean, you go short in opposite direction. So that's a little tip um, I have for you. Lastly, control your emotions. And this is part of us. It's human nature. If you have no emotions, you are going to be a very good trader. But unfortunately, even I go through emotions, and they're the ones that overtake whatever strategy I have. And I, it grinds me sometimes. Like, why can't, can't I just remove emotions to it? Or just click the off button of emotions? No. Emotions will, they say that you can know any other strategy, but your mindset, including your emotions, account 80% of that strategy, 10% risk management, and 10% of a trade strategy. So you could be a technical analyst that knows everything when this breakout happens, have this all planned out. If your mindset is not there, that is already 80% of your failure, of failure rate of your trade. You can get all the signals you want from this, but if you don't have the mindset onto, okay, okay, I can enter the trade. And I've had it, I've, I've entered trade just out of FOMO, driving, you know, the, then get there, and now I'm all huffing and puffing because it's it's falling, the rand particularly, and my mindset was not in there. I just was hit by FOMO, and it does FOMO. Hmm. So what you need to do is master emotions as well in order for you to master the market. Because if you can't, you need to be in a very good mind frame to to trade. So whatever I've given, whatever suggestions I've given could actually fall out the window if you don't have um, the correct mind frame. The biggest emotions they say is fear and greed. And those are the ones, at least you know what it is. You know, like it's I'm either suffering from fear or greed. Those are the two emotions. And fear because it makes you act contrary to human nature. Their substantial losses become very traumatic to you. There are some people where I'd say, no, really, get into if I had to mention Steinhoff to anyone now and say, no, it's time to buy, that trauma of how it felt, you'd be like, no, that's no, fine. I'm good. Because then it gets associated with that. Those losses are associated with some traumatic experience. They say it's, it's as traumatizing as going through an accident. That's how traumatic losses, you know, the, 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 the rate of losses are, they are compared to an accident. I, be honest. It, it is traumatic. It's quite... I mean, I've seen grown men cry over losses, you know. Good trading opportunities are then lost. 
if you're fearing and then you're like, get in, you're like, oh, oh, oh no. Oh. Gone is the opportunity. And trading then becomes associated with a painful experience. You just feel like, oh, no, let me just take a trader's vacation. And if forever taking a trader's vacation, the market's going up. Ten years down the ride, still in the trader's vacation. No. Greed on the opposite end, you become too overconfident and it's happened. Then you start increasing your lot sizes. Because you're feeling like, it's nice when you see the money tick up, but that is apparently you're at your most dangerous stage. And when you feel like increasing that lot size, you need to justify why, you if you're increasing it because you want, and it has happened to me, then that's the most dangerous stage. You should just be like, well, wait, let me, right? Instead, let me look at when to get out of the position instead of increasing it. And you'll always feel it. And if you train your brain that the minute I start feeling, oh, my God, you start, you start fantasizing about the money, that's the time you need to cut your position. Okay. The last is just showing you the trader's emotion cycle, which is pretty much true. If you're feeling euphoria, maximum financial risk, get out of the share. And, 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 you know, funny enough, when you're in your despondent part, that is the best time to get into trading. When you're all despondent, you're like, what's the point? Big old dummy, lost money. That's the best time. Because you've gone through the whole experiences of losing money. You have now, you've experienced, I always say losing the money is the best part because your brain grasps where you've gone wrong. And your next trade, you'll do better. If you're not losing money, you're, I'm not, I'm not jinxing you. Just, just worry about that. Because trading, you need to lose it to become better. Okay. When you're in the trade itself and you're feeling like, oh my God, what am I doing? Why am I here? You need to ask yourself these questions. Um, do I love this trade? The minute you say not really, maybe start considering. If it's, if it's making you feel some type of way, Am I confident in my trading decision? If these are no, is this an impulsive trade? If it's a yes, then you must know you should find an exit. Um, am I revenge trading? And I've done that. If, if, your, if your answer is yes, find an exit. Oh, is that it? Oh, I thought I had more. Okay, well, those are the questions that you need to. So if, you, if you're feeling a bit antsy about the trade you're in, Ask yourself these questions, and if you can say yes, no to any of those, then you should find an exit. And look, look, there are many other shares. You don't have to be in an Aspers. You don't have to be in a Discovery, you know? So be that said, I am going to share my views on the top 40 with everything that I have told you and how I then simulated into my analysis. But before I get there, are there any questions with what I've been saying? that you want to iron out. Or you could actually ask them later. No. Okay, these are my views. Okay, so this is the top 40 index, and this is how the monthly chart is looking. It's pretty evident that we are in a channel, an upward channel, and we're at the lower end of the channel. Monthly chart is saying, since 2009, your RSI has been forming rising bottoms, which is a bullish sign means there's been buying momentum, which is the result of this up of this um, upside. But now we're trading on the lower slope, and this is dated back to, sorry, this is dated back to 2009. Lower slope of 2009. It's failed one, two, a couple of times there, and now it's testing it. My only concern is that it has breached it, and now it's trying to recover. So if you've breached it, it means it's disrespected what it was used, it was ordinarily scared of. So it means sellers are like, oh, so buyers are not strong enough to actually hold it above that support. So it looks like there is a weakening in buying momentum. And another thing that's a bit concerning is the diverging RSI. So this is giving me a hold up. Um, we, we probably, this buying momentum or this bullishness could be getting exhausted. And the level that I would personally be looking at at the top 40 is that if it goes through 43, 770, I'd be concerned. But particularly, sorry, this has done something that was supposed to be up there. Oops. 
So the four, so if it goes above 49,925, I'd be concerned. But the level at most would be at 43,700. 43, Below that, it means we're getting to the distribution stage, which means we're going to be in a bear market. It's still holding. So what it's doing is it's trading sideways. So the most that could happen now is that it could then trade within this band between 55. 195 and for 43 which is quite a huge if you calculate that it's about 14,000 range band so I know that's how you would then trade it in between those levels moves but also with the with the mindset that it has negatively diverged meaning the buy momentum is not as rife as it was previously so it's giving us a caution if you look at it on the weekly chart it's pretty much on negative divergence there as well. Um, the only time I'd really turn bearish, bullish in the near term is if it trades anything above 49,230 towards 52,800. For as long as, in my eyes, for as long as it continues trading below 52,800, that is increasing the probability of us getting into a bear trend. So if it starts off next year and it's still trading below 52,800, we should start worrying. If you're in a long position with your long term position, uh, your long, you know, your, your investment, you would then start wanting to. So you reposition, get out of industrial stocks and into something else. If you have a lot of industrials in your in your portfolio. Yet again, weekly is also negative divergence, which started at the beginning of the year. So despite all this upside that we've been experiencing, that the RSI has been saying momentum is slowing, upside momentum is slowing. So this train is moving slower now, not as fast as it was or it should be. What's, your, uh, what's the MACD chart is telling us is it's a lower top. So although we're still in bullish territory, we are, and if you look at your histogram, it's starting to tick downwards. So there are a few little caution signals. Uh, you know, I'd only really be really, really strongly bullish oh, is if it started trading above 55,195. If it doesn't do, the second is 52,800. If it doesn't by the beginning of the year, the next is if it starts trading below 48,000, we are now forming falling tops towards the distribution stage. So it's testing that. Our histogram is starting to tick downwards. And if you look at that, if this starts to, if the histogram proceeds down, breaches that, then that would be a sign that you need to start thinking cautiously, unless anything happens. And this just goes above 55. Let's say 55, 200 as a round number. Then you'd be like, we missed it. But for as long as it's trading below there, we're on caution mode. And what does the 50 week moving average say? And this would be the 50 month. Remember this is the accumulation stage. That was the markup stage where possibly what we experienced this upside was the greedy stage. And the greedy stage can plateau towards the distribution stage. So if you draw your, your trend line, and you draw your support, which is those levels that were tested and, and held a few times. If that level is breached, then we're definitely going to start in the distribution stage. Remember the whole, the distribution stage will start, which is that markdown. How far the distribution stage is, we don't know. There's a lot of patterns that could form in between that could direct you. But what the top 40 is now saying is I'm in cautious mode. Um, I've rallied for so long, I might just take a bit of a downturn. And you don't want to be long some shares. It's pretty much what NASP has also showed us, particularly in distribution stage. So that's my view. Trade in between that range band, but particularly if it goes below 43, I think it's 43,000. We are in bear trend if, that goes, if it goes below that.